And that's a good overview. Um, you know, kind of got redundant there a while, but still, the overview was pretty good because it gives you an idea of what is said in their scripture, what Joseph Smith claims, and what the differences are from the Bible. Those are some. Those are just a few of them. Those are some of the big ones, though. That yeah, God, you know, God assumed. If it was just that that God assumed a mortal body and had relations with Mary, and say, well, that's weird, but whatever. Okay, but this other stuff that we're going to grow up and be gods, that, that there's a cycle going on. I mean, that there's this thing where everybody, if you follow the rules, you will get to be a god. And that's what's the deal is. Jesus became a god because he followed the rules. He was a good little Mormon. Okay? And if you are a good little Mormon, you too will grow up and be gods. And one of the key things is you have to know the secret. There are several secret handshakes that you have to know. Okay? And that you'll, you'll get taught them. When you tithe enough and go to church enough, they'll teach you what those secret handshakes are so that when you get to the gates of heaven, you'll know it. And they say, oh, well, you're cool. You can come in. But those people who don't know these handshakes are not going to make it. Okay? Now, this stuff, you think this, this, I'm, this, is, this, is, actual, this is actual part, part of Mormonism. Okay? All right. Now, where do, in dealing with the subject of cults, since this is the first talk on cults, I want to talk a little bit about the origin of cults. Um, cults have been around for a very long time. In the early church, before the first 100 years had passed, the church, there was a cult. Now, what is a cult? A cult is a deviation from orthodox belief, from accepted belief. Um, we have, you know, the, the church, at the, at the beginning, you had the apostles, and they went off and uh, evangelized, and various church leaders uh, 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 were trained. They were bishops or pastors, and they deferred to the apostles. And belief was kind of uniform, but not everybody. There are some people that took what the apostles taught and twisted it to their own end. The first of these, as far as we know, based on church history, was a fellow by the name of Simon Magnus. Anybody know, remember Simon Magnus? He's mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 8. Okay, let me, I'll just, I, have, I have a clip from the book of Acts. So This is from the New International Version, I believe. It's just word for word from Acts, chapter 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power, known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. 
You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Okay, now, the book of Acts leaves off there. It, 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 you don't hear anything more about Simon Magnus from the Bible. It's silent. However, church history picks up the story and explains that later, and, you know, when the apostles were mostly gone, only John was left, um, Simon Magnus started his own church. And he basically changed the rules and said, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, just like those other guys, but, you know, we are the enlightened ones. In order to be a real Christian, you've got to be in our little group. Jesus already came. You guys missed it, okay? You gotta, if you want to know the real truth, talk to us. And there are special things you have to do and special things you have to know. That's where the word Gnostics come from. He's the father of the Gnostic religion. Okay? The Gnostics were the first Christian cult. It is because of the Gnostics that we have something called Orthodox Christianity because what happened was the real, the real church had to figure out, wait a minute, these people are claiming to be the way. You wonder where all those extra secret books of the Bible come from? You hear about the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of uh, Judas and all this kind of stuff? That's where they come from, from the Gnostics. That was the group. Now, they, they wrote their books two, three hundred years after the events. Unlike, see, that's why we don't accept them in the Bible because they were written two, three, four hundred years later, all right? But what they're doing is trying to validate their particular spin on things. And in their faith, you can, if you have, have special knowledge, if you have special knowledge from them, then you can get into heaven. But you can't just read the Bible. You can't just join any old church. It's got to be our church. That was, the first, that was the first cult. And ever since then, we've had multiple cults that have developed. People who take the core and say, yeah, we, we like Jesus too. Oh, yeah. Even, even Islam, even the Muslims, that's, that's kind of a Christian cult as well. It's based on pre-existing faith. And they accept Jesus was a prophet, Moses was a prophet, but Muhammad is the best one. Muhammad is the latest one. Now we come to Mormonism, that's what the Gnostics were doing. Simon, yeah, Jesus was good, okay, God is good, but Simon Magnus, also a god. Listen to me too, I'm the, I'm the next level. I'm the next level. That's one thing that cults have in common. Is it says, they say, yes, Jesus was a good guy, the Bible is okay, but if you want to go to the next level and you want to see the true, true religion, you come to me. Does that make sense? All right. So let's leave that, leave that guy. Okay. And ultimately, he's got statues erected to him. They found, actually found statues uh, erected to Simon Magnus as a god. Okay. He, he had the Romans actually give, he actually has a statue devoted to himself. All right. Now, Joseph Smith, um, very interesting character. Uh, prior to him starting the Mormon faith, he had a job. And he got the job from his dad, basically. Him and his dad were uh, essentially seers. They were fortune finders. They used magic to find treasure for you. You would basically, you know, they, that's, that's kind of how it worked. And Joseph really picked up on that and, uh, and did it actually more than his dad. I'm not sure if his dad used the magic so much. His father was a fortune digger. Uh, Joseph uh, basically went into the, I think his, Joseph really chose to go off into the magic end of it. He was actually arrested um, for uh, being a con man uh, because people would pay him money to find hidden treasure and then he would get very close and then something would happen. His eyes would go bad, whatever, and something would happen and they never found it. And so they, they, they basically they, they would lose their money. He conned a number of people and was actually brought before a judge and convicted. The papers are still on record of his conviction for and the description of what he did. Okay? So that's what using this stone, that, that's kind of it. This right here is, this is, um, uh, just so you know that we're not making this up, this is the testimony of his father-in-law. The guy was married from between 20 to 34 women, okay? Ten of the women he married were married to other men at the time he married them, okay? So he changes the rules. Obviously, we know from the Bible that you're not supposed to be doing that. He did it in spades, okay? Not only did he marry multiple wives, almost half of the women he married had, pre had husbands there. Many of them never left their, they, they still live with their husbands. And they're, so they're visiting Joseph as his extra wife. Then they go home to their, their husband and kids. Okay? 
Um, very often, he would marry mother-daughter combinations. Both, both the mother and the daughter were married to him. He had several, several in his group like that. All right, so you, again, you've got to think about the character. If Jesus had done any of the things that Joseph Smith had done, I wouldn't be here. I'm telling you that right now. There is no way I would believe that Jesus was anything smelling of divine or of prophet if he had done a fraction of the things that Joseph Smith had done. Okay, this is, this is a testimony from his uh, father-in-law. It says, I first became acquainted with Joseph Smith Jr. in November 1825. He was at the time in the employ of a set of men who were called money diggers. And his occupation was that of seeing. What is a seer? A prophet, yeah. So he basically hired him as a prophet, as a seer. Okay? All right. Or pretending to see by means of a stone placed in his hat. Now, his father-in-law said he pretended to see by means of a stone. He put, while he was out digging a well with his brother Hiram, he found this brown, this, this chocolate-covered brown smooth stone. And he believed that it had magical properties. And so that by putting that stone in a hat and holding the hat to his head, he could see things. He could see the treasure and he could see the spirits that were guarding the treasure. And so he knew how to get to that. That was his whole thing. That with this stone, I have magical powers because this stone is a magic stone. Okay? So, in this way, he pretended to discover minerals and hidden treasures. His appearance at this time was that of a careless young man, not very well educated and very saucy and insolent to his father. Smith and his father, with several other money diggers, boarded at my house while they were employed in, in, in digging for a mine that they supposed to have been opened and worked.